and all by going back and forth from them. And it's, but, uh, but I meant more even like in, in addresses on national TV when you're in the Oval Office and you're reading right oh, into the prompter. There? I mean, you don't appear to be reading at all. <laughs> well, you know, you can see dimly that little lens image through right. the glass. Right. So you try, you do kind of it with peripheral vision, you try to keep your eyes as much as possible on that spot uh, on the teleprompter while you're reading the words. Is this the way you have it? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we're rolling. <laughs> and mine? <laughs> How do you want to do this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just fine with me. <laughs> the only thing I object to is you go boat off that light. <laughs> You can take them out of Hollywood, right? But <laughs> what, did, what did that? What did you say? Gobo off that light, Mr. President? Hmm? What did you say? Gobo off that light? Gobo. What's that mean? Well, that's well, that, like in Hollywood when they're lighting a scene, and then they only want, let's say, say that light there. They only want the top half of it. Right. Uh, oh, I think in there. Then they have on the same kind of racks like that. Well, they have big black bars. Uh, that's true. It's not bad, but it's fabric bars. And then they run one of those up and then say go bow off. And they have lights in Hollywood that are called the broads. And you, you should see the visitors when somebody yells out, a cameraman yells out, "Hey, go bow the broad." <laughs> 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 Sounds like some kinky thing that they do in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, I did a long interview with, with Jimmy Stewart for the archives of the Kennedy uh, Center uh, for, you know, for having won the award, and we were talking about screen tricks, and he said that for Destry Rides Again, that, that Marlena Dietrich taught him, that when you're, when you're, taught, when you're facing somebody, to look, at, to look both of them in just one eye. Did they ever learn that? In other words, instead of me looking at you, both of your eyes where I end up sort of flickering back and forth, to just look at one eye so then my eyes will remain steady as I look at you. Well, I know they've written from the meat dancer this better also for the stage. I know that in the stage, um, to keep from being diverted, uh, that many performers uh, will look you in the forehead like I'm looking now. Oh, was that in the, the, the forehead? In the forehead. For that same reason, so your gaze oh, is steady? No. no, I say that some on stage have done that. Uh, that there has been an old stage trick to keep from being diverted or anything to really yeah that's oh no what oh no honey that's a ter ter that's a terrible trick to do <laughs> well i know it's terrible yeah but they do Bob, it is it can we do something about her her mm -hmm. microphone it looks it looks ugly i i'd hate you to think mine? <laughs> I, I, I'd hate to think during Hellcats of the Navy that, you know, this great romantic movie that you were actually looking at Mrs. Reagan's fort with one, and there are actors that do that. Right. You see, then you it's feel mean. you haven't got something to play back with. Right, right. In reality, I, I should have explained, though, this is a, a trick. Oh, to throw somebody off? performers do, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's mean. Yeah, that would really do it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's you're, mean. You're, 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 you're looking at me, and I'm looking up at your eyes, yeah. and you get, you're getting nothing. Yeah, and, you're, yeah. and you keep on going <laughs> up. <and you're laughs> Come in, Lucky. Have they got a microphone on you? Huh? I don't know about this obedience school that Lucky went to. <laughs> you, did, are you sure that she passed? Lucky. Lucky, you were cured of that. You went to school. You're not supposed to do that. that. Hey. No. Not before the 24th. And certainly not me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time she's done hey, that. Hey, Lucky, don't bite the... Do you suppose there's something up here at Camp David that makes her wolf? That's the first time she's done that since... What, nip, back from nip? the training is kind of, you know, she used to as a pup when you try to get down there to her face and she'd want to chew We got the you. gauze and the blankets and everything out. And you don't need it. Uh-huh. Lucky did? You're kidding. No. <laughs> I'll be darned. Somebody else did too. She hasn't got lipstick on. <laughs> did you sip out of that glass? That's my glass. My glass doesn't have any ice in it. That's my glass. Oh, and Lucky yeah. was in there? No. I see. Well, that's all in the family. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You no know germs that they get passed around. Uh, are you guys, what are, how are we doing? Are we ready? Yes. Once again, please, if anybody has any Okay, guys. All right. 
It appears to an observer that after 33 years of marriage, you two are still absolutely nuts about each other. Mrs. Reagan, how do you plead? <laughs> Guilty. Guilty. <laughs> uh, explain it. I mean, it, it, is an, it seems to be an extraordinary relationship. Well, how do you explain it? We're happy. But why does it work so well? Want to have a crack at that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, um, I think we work at it. Um, we work at it. This is going to be a long interview. If we <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer it. I just... Uh, well, I don't know as far as a, from a man's standpoint, uh, as far as I could say is I think Clark Gable once said the line to someone and said there's nothing more important than approaching your own doorstep and knowing that someone on the other side of the door is listening for the sound of your footsteps. And do you feel that every day as you come home? Yes. And are you sitting there waiting? It, it, it is uh, an extraordinary relationship. Let me ask you about, about Camp David. Uh, I have the impression that you generally come to Camp David without visitors and important guests, that you, you generally come, just the two of you, off by yourselves. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Some people get the sense that you two really are happiest when you're off by yourselves. <laughs> well, we're surrounded by, by people all week long, and mm -hmm. it's like you have to be by yourself to recharge and, and, uh, and have time alone. Chris, I guess, I guess we are happiest when we're... I know that uh, when I was a bachelor in Hollywood, I uh, well. was a frequenter of the Friars Club, you know, and my fellow actors go there for dinner and all of that. And um, I stopped going to the Friars Club after I got married. That's the biggest compliment he could pay you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, with all the, the pressures of your job, though, if we could talk seriously just for a moment, uh, how does Mrs. Reagan act as a, as a, as a uh, pressure release from that? You know, I mean, how are you able to sort of let your hair down with her, with, with her in a sense that, uh, that it, it rejuvenates you and it allows you to go back and face the next day? Well, you're asking questions that are, that are kind of hard to put in words. They're kind of things that, that just happen. Uh, we, we do get along, and we... Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, I know that during the day, and well, even before this job, uh, whatever I was doing, something would happen in the day, and the first just thing that would go through my mind was uh, picturing myself telling her about it when I got home. Is that kind of what makes it complete, going home and telling Mrs. Reagan yes. what happened? Yeah. Do you ever fight? We disagree. No. We, you know, fight, fight to me means uh, um, throwing plates and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Calling all names. of that. <laughs> you know, uh, no. Sure, of course, there's nobody that you're going to agree with all the time, even your husband. What's the last thing you disagreed about? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, one of the basic issues we're examining in this, in this program is whether after a rough start, Mrs. Reagan has grown in self-assurance and self-confidence. Do you, over the four and a half years that she has been First Lady, see a change in Mrs. Reagan? Yes, uh, and it is a case of growth. Um, I think things that uh, once bothered her excessively and could really get to her uh, don't anymore. Uh, she takes them in stride and uh, some of the unfair criticisms and so forth and uh, I guess she kind of treats them now like we, we used to treat, uh, uh, well, an unfavorable review of, a, uh, of your part in a, in a, in a picture. You, uh, uh, you dusted it off. Said as long as the people buying the tickets liked it, uh, that's all that counts. Do you do you feel that you've grown during the four and a half years? Yes, yes, I do. But I think uh, I think anybody who who doesn't, when they're in this when they're in this position, is 
I, I don't know how you could not grow, given all the all the circumstances, all the people you meet, all the places you go, all the all the experiences you have. You have to grow. It seemed to me, Mr. President. I hate to bring this up, but I think I. But he's going to. But I, I am going to. I, I believe it is true that Mrs. Reagan's standing in the polls is even higher than yours is right now. And I can understand that. <laughs> and I didn't vote for me. I voted for her. <laughs> and some people said after the trip to Europe that she was the star. How do you feel about occasionally taking second billing? As long as it is to her, I'm very happy. No, that, well, no. I mean, that's nice and everything, but, but but he had all the hard work. See, we're disagreeing. <laughs> <laughs> but that certainly isn't a fight, by the way, that I see most uh, husbands and wives fight. During the economic summit, I think it was the first dinner, uh, much of that dinner apparently was spent talking about your wife's drug efforts and the First Lady's conference. And out of that summit came a, a decision that there's going to be an international crackdown on drugs. What did that mean to both of you? to see Mrs. Reagan's work being taken so seriously on an international level? It meant a lot to me. Well, it did to me also. I told them about it because obviously there, uh, so many of them had a personal interest because they're uh, you know, the wives that had come here to be with her on that particular international episode. There were, what, 18 countries, 17 other first ladies joined you and then on that subject so I reported to them there at the dinner that opening night uh, about this and how successful it had been. And it was Margaret Thatcher that then spoke up first and said, well, you know, why don't we? And it was unanimous. They all joined in so that uh, it became something that the summit is now going to also carry forward. I'm going to ask you another tough one in terms of trying to put something into words, but I know you've always loved this lady. How does it feel, though, when you see her organizing and carrying off major drug conferences and going off, not as the wife of, but on her own to see the Pope and to have a, uh, you know, an audience? What does that mean to you? What, what, what's your feeling from that? Well, I'm very proud and uh, very pleased that she is doing that because I know how much it means to her. And uh, no, I don't feel that I've been left behind in any way. You don't miss her at all when she... Oh, I miss her. <laughs> oh, yes, I miss her. Uh, particularly if it's overnight, I don't sleep very well. <laughs> well, that now we'll understand the next day when you're sleepy that that's because she was, she was away. <laughs> Mr. President, I believe it's true that you have suggested that Mrs. Reagan suffered more emotional trauma from your assassination attempt than you did. Do you believe that? I think that it took her longer to heal than it did me. And I can understand that. The, uh, actually when it's happening to you and you, I was confident that I was going to be all right and all, but um, it is harder. And I'm sure it would be for me harder to, uh, have to stand by and see uh, someone else and, and the worry that goes with it. Do you believe that's true, Mrs. Reagan? I'm, I, I, I'm sure it took me longer, yes. I'm sure there was a, that there was a period of, of uh, shock that I, wasn't, that I was not aware of that I was in for, for a long time, that he was aware of, other people were aware of, but I wasn't. If I could add, if I could add just, just picture the difference. All right, it's happened to me, and I'm there, and I know, and. I'm going to the hospital and so forth. But then the difference of someone at home on what's a normal routine day, and someone walks in and says, what has happened, it's got to be a lot worse than it is to the person that it happened to. Which one of you do you think still thinks about it more? I know she does. <laughs> and, no, I don't. I do. <laughs> and, and I know that, that Mrs. Reagan still is constantly worried about security. Yes, but uh, when anybody ever asks me about uh, security and Secret Service and doesn't it bother me and so on, and I say, not at all, I'm very happy <laughs> to have them. If it weren't for, 
for them, I wouldn't have a husband. Are you aware of what a strain that is for her still when you go off on a trip, that, that, that that's always in the back of her mind, something could happen? Yes. I can understand it very well, because like when she went off to Rome, what do you think was on my mind? I mean, because of, obviously, the terrorist threats there. Yes. And so how do you live with that? Well, I think we both have a great deal of confidence in the people who were in, in charge of their security. Uh, I did a little checking before she went away. Really? You did? Uh, yes. I didn't know that. What, what did you check? Wanted to make sure that there was plenty of it. <laughs> <laughs> did you not know that? I didn't know that. And you really, I mean, personally hands-on, wanted to make sure that, uh, that she'd be safe there? Mm-hmm. And in all fairness, I have to say that um, my remarks were really unnecessary because those in charge had had the same thought and were doing everything that should be done. I think the only danger she had in Rome was from Marcello Mastroianni, not from <laughs> 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 one of those good-looking Italian men. <laughs> Mr. President, how much do you rely on Mrs. Reagan's advice on matters of personnel and policy? Well, we, we certainly talk about uh, things like that. Well, as I said earlier, we talk about everything. And uh, sometimes we disagree on, on uh, someone or their particular qualifications or something, but uh, never very seriously. And, but it's good to talk about it and have other input, just as I also do that. And not that I'm in love with the cabinet, but I do that with other people in the, in the administration, too. But, but obviously, this is a special relationship. And this is the person you talk to yeah. more than anyone else. And how, how important is her advice on serious matters? Well, very important, isn't very it? Very important. Absolutely. Yes. Mm. See? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, and I, I feel better always knowing that we're in agreement on something. Mrs. Reagan has told us that she thinks that she's a little tougher and perhaps a little smarter about staff than you I are. I didn't say smarter. Well, you said that you saw things that, that uh, your husband doesn't see. In fact, I think you used the expression soft touch <laughs> for him. Do you think that's true, that she perhaps is a little more discerning of who's maybe pursuing their own agenda? Well, she has a great confidence in feminine intuition. And uh, I don't discount feminine intuition either. But I do think that there are some things that uh, uh, maybe male and female do see from different angles. But if she says to you, you know, I think so-and-so is maybe not doing the right job, how seriously do you, do you take that? Well, I don't remember anyone her ever saying that about a job or something. It, it has to, whether doing the job, because I'm in a position to know whether the job is being done. I think it's more and sometimes questioning whether loyalty should, is all that it should be, things of that kind. And if she questions that? Well, I'm aware of that then, and I think probably keep my eyes open <laughs> a little better. I, some people have suggested, and I wonder what you both think of that, 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 that while you're very happy confronting uh, hard issues, that, that, that complaining about the schedule or facing someone down who you think hasn't done a good job, that, that you're not very comfortable with that, and that perhaps you are more willing to take those, those hard tasks on than, than your husband and maybe do it for him. Is, is there some truth to that? You're asking me or? Well, you first. <laughs> Why don't you ask him first? Okay. <laughs> you want to get your story straight? <laughs> well, I think there's some unpleasant things that uh, always had, that have to be done when they have to be done in human relations that uh, aren't very pleasant and uh, and yes I, I, I don't like that uh, the, I try to be understanding of everyone's viewpoint or the other fellow's viewpoint uh, and uh, so it's it uh, yes it's difficult for me if, if if there is some disciplining that is needed or uh, even some uh, change of personnel. It sounds like he does occasionally hope that maybe you'll take that curtain <laughs> off his hands. <laughs> no. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, 
harder for him. In other words, I'm a soft touch. <laughs> <laughs> I think right. the answer is yes. Right, right, right. Do you, when, when Mrs. Reagan is pushing a particular point of view, Mr. President, do you sometimes say no to her? Yes. Oh, sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. And uh, do you always take his no as a final no, Mrs. Reagan? Um, <laughs> yes, although I may come back to it a little bit later and try again. <laughs> you, you've, you've seen that when she'll fall back five steps and then uh, try again? Come in from a different direction. <laughs> and are there finally, at some point, is there a no that means that's no. it? That's it? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> on the policy area, how much input do you think you have on policy, as opposed to oh, these no. personnel questions? No. No. Mm -mm. That's not my... That's, that's not my... Uh, I'll confirm that. No. No. What, one area, and I must say that's what we generally hear. Uh, should we just change? Could, could we have a couple more questions? Do you remember her weighing in on that subject? Oh, I remember us talking about it. And and what could be done, and the, um, and it did bother me. There are a few things like that that bother you when you when I know they're so completely untrue, so completely false. Uh, I think wanting a strong and adequate defense uh, should not be used uh, by others to indicate that uh, uh, that you want to start a shooting war. Uh, I've seen four of them in my lifetime involving our country, and uh, I would think one of the hardest things that a president would ever have to do is make the decision to send those young men into peril and, and see them lose their lives. Uh, it must be a heartbreaking thing to do. Mrs. Reagan, uh, there have been several times during the last few months where it appeared that you were prompting the president on how to answer reporters' questions. What was going on there? I think the, the time at the ranch. Well, there are a couple. One was the time at the ranch, we're doing everything we can, and there was yeah. also one, I think, at a Special Olympics event where he was asked about uh, uh, the, the airlift of the Ethiopian Jews, and you said something like, no comment, or something, and he said, no comment. And, there have been a couple of instances where it appeared. The, certainly I the, remember the, that. The one at the ranch was the... But one at the ranch, I remember, because it was a question, and, I, and I, now I don't remember what the question was. I think it was something about what are you doing in terms of arms control with the Soviets. It was on yeah, what, what, yes, what are, you, what are you doing to try to uh, yeah. bring about... The, yeah. And it was a question that, that had been asked over and over and over again. And it was a question that was beginning to really get to me. And um, uh, I really was not prompting. What I was really doing was talking to myself. It just annoyed me so that I put my head down, never dreaming that he would hear me. <laughs> never dreaming. And, put my and head the, the truth is, I, w I had paused because, again, being faced that question so many times, I'd paused to say, well, you know, what am I going to say to it this time? And when I heard her saying that, I thought, yes, that's it. <laughs> we are. We're doing all we can. But I'll yeah. never talk to myself again. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't prompt you. Uh, no. <laughs> Mr. President, how good a politician is Mrs. Reagan? Oh. Absolutely sensational, don't you think so? Took the words <laughs> right out of my mouth. <laughs> I think she's prompting you again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I don't know. We both of us, we talk about that. And it, there is one thing, however, let me, you've opened a door for me to say something, because it isn't all that important uh, in our conversations. I have, and from the days when I was a governor, I made up my mind then that the only way you could live with yourself is if you made decisions on policy on a basis of what you honestly believed was best for the people, right or wrong for the people. And I informed a cabinet in California of that. Those have been the instructions to this cabinet. I don't want to hear the political ramifications of a decision that we have to make. Because if you start thinking in that way, mm -hmm. then that's, I think that happens too much in legislatures, where the decisions are made on the basis of the political ramifications, the next election, and so forth. All, 
the only way I think you can live with yourself is you may make a mistake, but it'll be an honest mistake. You, you honestly believe that you've done what is the best thing for the people. But let me ask you, looking back to the 84 campaign, because we've talked to a number of people like Ed Rollins and Stu Spencer and Dick Worthlin, uh, who say, looking back at that campaign, and then you certainly you are talking politics in a campaign, that, that Mrs. Reagan is one of the most astute, canny politicians they've ever known. I mean, how, I guess what I'm really asking you as a political pro, how good a politician is she? Well, I think uh, when she talks about something of that kind, uh, I think that she's reflecting what you could feel is, uh, would be the reaction uh, on, a broader, on a broader scale of more people. It's a reaction to what, uh, or I mean it's a reflection of what the reaction would be to to some decision. So you think she has pretty good antenna in that sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Reagan, some people have suggested that you have been the driving force in your husband's career and that you wanted the presidency more than he did. Yeah, I know. I, I've read that too. Not true. I, I thought I married an actor. <laughs> 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 and um, um, the Actually, he was asked, he was asked to run for, for uh, office uh, soon after we got married and turned it down by the Democrats, when he was still a Democrat. And um, then when the governorship came along, I went along with it, but that wasn't something that I had carved out for, for our future. And certainly the presidency wasn't something that I said, you've got to do this. No, that, that isn't true. Just isn't As a matter true. of fact, she was dragging her feet quite a bit about running for re-election in the presidency. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't going to ask you that, but how'd you persuade her? Uh, well, it wasn't a case of... Like a steady no. drumbeat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Really? <laughs> yes. Let me, let me just say one thing on this. Neither one of us ever really set out to do what we now find ourselves doing. Uh, when, the, when the group came, in 1965, after the 64 election, when I had uh, supported the candidacy of, of Barry Goldwater, I had always thought that my contribution could be that being a performer and thus well known and able to maybe attract an audience, that I could support people and causes I believed in. Never did I ever think that I would want to hold public office. And this group came after the party had been so torn apart in the dissension of that particular campaign with regard to the governorship that the California party was so split that maybe we could have a hand in bringing them together and they kept emphasizing that I could win and our first reaction was you know don't talk foolishness go find a candidate and I'll be very happy to do everything I can to help him but no that's not for us that's not our way of life well they kept on and they kept on until we couldn't sleep. And it seemed to be such a total change of our entire life that uh, finally I said, what if they're right? And, and what if the, this is something and we wouldn't be able to live with ourselves if we say, keep on saying no? So the deal I made then, and with perfect confidence that it would not result in my running for office, was I said, all right, if you set it up so that I can accept all the speaking engagements here in California, not just political, chambers of commerce, things of that kind. Let me, for the next six months, and I'll come back and tell you before the six months is over, whether you're right that I should be the candidate or whether there's somebody else and I'll continue doing what I've been doing in the past. And they did that. And I did my best uh, out there when people come up after a speech and say, uh, you know, you ought to do this, and I'd say no, and I'd start talking to someone else. And I finally came home one night and said, they're right. I, I think I do have the best chance of winning. Now it's a case, we almost, we've, I don't think it's true, but we've almost decided between ourselves that when finally I gave in and said yes, I did it with the idea in mind that it was only for the election, that when the election was over, I could go back to doing what I was doing. And, but you know, uh, but, but you know um, I think what people get mixed up, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and, and this whole thing of my, my pushing, pushing him. 
that they don't understand that uh, if he had decided to go into the shoe business, I'd be out pushing shoes. You know, whatever. Aren't you glad he didn't? <laughs> yes. Now, that was my next point. <laughs> my next point was that, that actually, as it's all turned out, he's given me the most um, fascinating, interesting, wonderful, frustrating at times, frightening at times, but a, a life I never, ever thought I'd have. What do you say to that, Mr. President? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it happened to both of us, though. We, it was some time after I'd become governor, and we were sitting, we were sitting now in the living room, and all of a sudden it came from both of us that what we were doing was made everything else we'd ever done seem dull as dishwater. And that was the expression that she used. And it was true. It, I'd, never, I, I'd never anticipated it. I thought I was really sacrificing something I loved doing for something that was really going to be a chore. But the, to actually, instead of just talking about the problems from the outside, to actually deal with them and to have a hand in, well, one man uh, who was a governor back when I was a performer had said to me, about his job. He said that sometimes he went home feeling 10 feet tall. And uh, we've both felt that way about it uh, since. That it is a, it's a great opportunity to be of service, but it's a, and it's a great challenge. And yes, we're, we're glad we did it. Let me, get, <clears throat> let me get into one last area, if I might. <clears throat> Mr. President, do you think that uh, Mrs. Reagan will leave her own mark as a first lady beyond being your wife? Oh, I think she's made such a mark already. I, uh, I saw that on the last trip to Europe. <laughs> but no, yes, she has. And I think uh, uh, this cause that she's interested in uh, is, she, she grew into that and was very concerned about it and then found out that was in a position to do something about it and uh, yes, she's made her own mark. And how do you think, when it's all said and done, she will rank among first ladies? Well, with me, number one. <laughs> I, I, I won't speak for the other people out there. I'm done, but I do, there's one thing I do have to ask you because it's, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick myself if I don't. When you say, when, the, when you were seeking, the question of seeking re-election, that it was a steady drumbeat, can you just explain what you meant by that? <laughs> well, it's like uh, when, when you asked me about um, um, personnel, that if he says no, then all right, it's no, but then a little while later I might come back at him. <laughs> Right. From another angle. So how did you dis so, the decision to seek re-election? So he would, he, he would talk about it, and I would say, gee, I, I don't know. And then we'd let it drop, and then he'd come back at it <laughs> again. So it became... It was not what she's saying. It was not a cut-and-dried thing that I just automatically was going to do that. I had, I had my concerns and wonders as to whether I, I should do that again. And... Um, then the more that I'd hear and the more things would happen, the more I would come back and say, I, I just don't know how, how we, we can't do that. Yeah, no, and, and, and at the end, uh, in all honesty, I, I have to say, I, I, um, I could understand how, how he felt that uh, there, was so, there was so much more to do that he wanted to do that he couldn't get done in four years, and he was on a track that he wanted to see completed, and that it was important, and and uh, and I felt it was too. Mrs. Reagan, Mr. President, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> thank you, Lucky. <laughs> Lucky was a champ. Wherever you are. <laughs> Wherever you are. Thank you. That was just lovely. Chris, oh. try to get one side shot. Just, just for, do you mind just sitting for still for a minute right. now that we've wrecked your Saturday? Williams is used to that. <laughs> well, they're very generous. I know that this is not the way you, you want to spend your time. 
but that's very, very kind. I better put my arm back where it was. Matching shots, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I must tell you, I, as you know, I have been a big fan of your wife's for many years. Uh, I think when this show, and I'm not just buttering you up because I've done all the interviews now, I can say anything I want. I think when the show is, is, is completed, that what you have seen and a lot of the people who are close to Mrs. Reagan have seen that, that the country is going to see. One? That the country is going to see about her when, this, when the show is there. How about that? Yeah. You got about 88. <laughs> <laughs> Are we rolling? Can we use that? <laughs> That's right. It's like sort of like uh, I mean that's a that's a, a hallowed tradition in the South, isn't it? That uh, governors have their wives then run for governor. <laughs> well, there that's have right. been some instances of that. That's right. I think uh, Governor Edwards of Louisiana and Governor Wallace, Wallace. in Alabama. Yeah. What do you think about that? No, that's not the way I see it. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are you going to give a Sherman-like uh, response? If elected, I will not serve. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I think we're set.